All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we're a little bit behind, so we'll probably just go through through to 12 o'clock, uh, if that's okay with everybody here. Uh, this panel is on uh, how compliance regulations get made, and uh, we have David Mortman as our moderator here, a repeat speaker at source. Um, he's put together a great panel from uh, quite a different uh, number of different uh, regulatory requirements, and I'm going to let him introduce this panel. So, David. Thanks, Chris. So. Uh we're going to talk of, I have a panel of experts here who have been involved in one way or another in how uh, various compliance regulations we have to deal with on a daily basis uh, get made. Uh, I'll let my panelists introduce themselves, starting with uh, Katie Masuris, who is uh, Skyped in from uh, Kuala Lumpur. Thanks. So I'm Katie Masuris. Can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Um, well, I'm a senior security strategist with Microsoft, and uh, I am actually at this moment um, in Malaysia, and uh, I'm here for the ISO meeting, ironically enough. So I'm working on a ISO uh, draft standard on responsible vulnerability disclosure. Thank you, Katie. Jack. Hi, I'm uh, Jack Daniel, and uh, I shouldn't be a compliance guy, but compliance is what rained on our parade so much that uh, uh, I am. I'm actually a network and systems admin who's grown into a whole bunch of other jobs, but that's what I do. I fix things that mangle our packets, but I can't even do that without compliance getting in my way. <coughs> and uh, which compliance framework are you going to talk about? Uh, Mass 201 CMR 17 particularly. Uh, it was uh, an interesting introduction that I got dragged into that. Cool, thanks. Mike? Uh, my name's Mike Don. Uh, I've been in involved in the payment card industry for about seven or eight years now. I uh, did a lot of training and education. If, if you've met a QSA, I've probably trained them and also did, uh, trained about 10,000 different uh, merchants, service providers, acquirers for uh, a large payment brand. And my name is Dave Lewis. I am the Information Security Officer for a critical infrastructure company in Ontario, Canada. And I've actually been uh, working in and around the power system industry now for roughly about eight years. Cool. Thanks. And uh, I actually have nothing to do with any compliance regulation except for having to implement it at various companies. And it, it's been tough, so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to uh, get people's perspective on uh, how this stuff happens and the, re the realities versus uh, the perception. So uh, first, I'd like our panelists to tell me about how they got involved with this whole compliance thing to begin with, and uh, why they're still involved, and then we can get into some uh, stories about how things actually happen. Katie? Okay, you all, you all sound a little bit like Hubert right now, so I don't know if I sound any better to you. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll try and make this work. So we've actually been uh, trying this all week with uh, the um, plume of doom, the volcano, grounding half of the ISO delegates. So uh, we've had intermittent problems with uh, trying this, so we'll see how well it works here. Um, essentially, how I got roped into doing this ISO thing uh, was because I was a subject matter expert on vulnerability disclosure, and uh, when we heard that there was uh, going to be a draft international standard on it, first thing we thought was, why? Uh, there were certainly enough guidelines out there um, so the, the way that ISO works is that people vote by national body, and uh, only about four of all the participating national bodies voted against creating an ISO standard. The United States was one of those four. Um, but, you know, since other countries thought it would be valuable and useful, um, it did get uh, passed into the work item for the ISO group. So once that happened and it was a work item, well, we decided to work on it. So. Um, so I got tapped to be uh, the subject matter expert for the U.S. national body on vulnerability disclosure participating in the ISO process. So that's how it happened to me. So now that you've been involved with this for a while, do you still uh, think it's a good idea? Well, define good. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to come home yet? Uh, what? <laughs> Are you ready to come home yet? Oh, well, I'm always ready to come home from the road because, uh, you know, I hate leaving my family. But, um, 
No, it's been a bumpy ride, uh, all told, and especially this week, it's been particularly dramatic, and one would not think that standards meetings would be dramatic, um, because there's a whole lot of formality, and, you know, old men yelling at clouds, and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty dry stuff, the, the stuff of standards, but um, the emotions that are involved, the territorialism, the politics, both actual politics, because this is on the score of national bodies, so these are literally nations, you know, uh, coming together to try to make an, you know, an agreement. But, you know, the usual type of politics going on. So, uh, it's never dull, I can tell you that much. Um, and yes, I am quite ready to come home. Thanks. Jack? Mm -hmm. So, uh, my path into uh, dealing with compliance uh, more than tangentially was a few years ago People started talking about this pending Massachusetts uh, regulation tool in CMR 17. Um, I would occasionally deal with, touch people that were dealing with PCI uh, assessments or other things in my role as a support engineer for uh, Astara. We, people would need help figuring out what was going on. But tool in CMR 17 was, was here in Massachusetts and it was uh, the regulatory and prescriptive component of our breach disclosure law. And so I read a, uh, an article in a I don't remember where, uh, but I looked at it and said, oh, that sounds kind of interesting, but it seems odd. And then I found a, a blog post about it uh, from someone who seemed like they ought to know, and uh, it, the two contradicted considerably. So then I uh, took the, the leap of faith and wound my way through and found the actual document, read all six pages of it, and discovered both, uh, both uh, articles were substantially wrong, and that uh, the, the subject matter experts hadn't read six pages. And so... Uh, I thought that was it, but I made a few comments, a couple of blog posts, spoke about it in a couple of groups, and the next thing, you know, I, I kept getting dragged deeper and deeper into it, and it was uh, a lot of misinformation about it. And then I realized that, uh, wow, that, that's true of uh, everything that I look at, from PCI to, you know, you name it, that there are a lot of people spouting things, and uh, people are taking advice. My customers are taking advice from people who don't know what they're uh, actually talking about. <laughs> It's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> Mike? Uh, is, this, is this a particular question or is there a We're just gonna experience? Talk, talk, you're going to talk about sort of how you got involved in this and yeah, uh, you yeah. know, why, why you're doing it today. And yeah, certainly. Um, you know, I got involved in it uh, a, a long time ago when uh, I was working for a card brand and they were looking for someone who had actually implemented the particular standard to help train and educate a lot of other people. Um, and I'm still involved in it today because, uh, well, it, when it comes to the payment card industry, uh, when it comes to compliance, uh, you know, the PCI standard is one that tends to cut across multiple organizations. And I still find that a lot of people need that kind of level of education. Um, I, I did definitely want to echo what Katie mentioned in terms of the, uh, the emotion of the politics and territorialism that exists. These types of things exist in every type of organization. And, and unfortunately, they exist in many different uh, associations and such. And so you see different types of people making plays, right? And not necessarily within the group itself, but uh, specifically, you know, people that say, I I've got certain feedback. I want it changed a certain way, right? Everyone has their own way. They want things changed. Um, actually, Josh Corman, one of the people in the audience, he asked a question which made me start to think is, what are the top three things that you would think of to, to really improve uh, re the regulatory space? I think those three things really are, number one is education. I found so often, and still participating in it today, I find that people choose inaction over action uh, when they don't know uh, specifically what to do or what is meant by a particular item. So education is super key. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, flexibility of controls, right? Regardless of uh, what the controls are, we see that, I mean, we know that there are different influences in them, right? And so, of course, we need different types of flexibility controls. We need these controls to be able to apply to multiple different types of organizations. So they have to be maintained flexible. And the third thing that we really need is uh, transparency and increased threat data so we can do better risk modeling. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, these controls are going to evolve and change, and we're hoping that they're going to evolve and change based on uh, the emerging threat, threat and attack patterns that we're seeing in the industry, right, specific to each industry. And one of the things I find interesting as well, and I'll, and I'll shut up, is that uh, the threats and risks that exist today 
right, are very specific to an industry. So power and energy, very different from payment card industry, right? Very different from uh, personal data protection and things like that. And I think that that's a, something that we have to stay aware of when we're looking at all these different types of data and when 